All right. Let's talk about our next speaker. This is the final part of the afternoon session. We will have three sessions here in this room, and then we will split into the parallel sessions after that. And our first speaker is Leszek Wojtkowski, and he will talk about the data Thank you very much. Um, Pleasure to give a talk in this inspiring location, Cape Town, which I'm thankful to the organizers. And uh, as we heard yesterday, that very field is a very active field. Uh, lots of things are happening on the experimental side, and lots of things are happening on the theoretical side, and the interface of the two. And many people get uh, inspired by different things that are happening on the experimental side, uh, various hints. Uh, I, in turn, would get my, get my inspiration from uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson, which may be a bit of an unlikely source of inspiration. And I'll try to give you a focused view of why I think the Higgs boson has, been, has told us, is telling us something very important about the nature uh, of, the, of the dark matter. So this will be a focused view. And I'll try to also bring a, a broader context to uh, give to those who are not entirely excited about this particular view and also those who are outside of the view to go to context. Uh, so this would be basically the message that I would like to convey to you would be that the dark matter would have a mass of 1 TeV, about 1000 GeV, and it would be a certain type of uh, uh, neutralino, supersymmetric neutralino. Many people say dark matter could be this, could be that, I'm just saying dark matter is this, not could be. I believe very strongly that there is a very strong thing for this kind of uh, solution. So, this is uh, certainly very strongly uh, motivated in uh, supersymmetry with, uh, super with uh, in, the, in the context of some sort of ground identification. Uh, the, the, I'll try to argue that the, the Higgs mass value, the value of the Higgs mass is standing in just that, in the context of the models. And then I'll talk about prospects for detection. But also, as I mentioned, I will give you a broader context within the context of a broad framework of phenomenological supersymmetry, many parameters, and I'll discuss prospects for direct detection and for CTA, which I think will be of strong interest also here. Uh, this is based on several papers from our group, the sort of base fits group, for the subsets of it. And uh, the last part of the talk will be based on the forthcoming paper, which will appear hopefully two days from now. All right, so uh, very briefly in terms of the introduction, before you heard an introduction yesterday, and so a couple of many other short introductions, we know that there is much more out there than meets the eye, and the WIMP hypothesis reigns. WIMP is a very broad context with anything very, very quickly or subject interacting. But remains so those, there are many footprints of that matter, and I'm just flashing them for completeness, but uh, there's no time we really need to go through all this, because this world long has been already said. Basically, there are various footprints in various, in various uh, landscapes, in different scales, and different uh, uh, structures, but they are the only effects of gravitation. We'd like to see it with some different signal. So uh, this is by summary slide for what our uh, candidates could be, what candidates could be, on um, this very, very broad uh, plane, mass versus typical interaction cross-section of the such thing with a uh, with, uh, with, uh, detector, starting from uh, weak interactions and small masses like neutrinos, but you know, you know neutrinos uh, uh, might be relativistic, but we can call that better, so that there is proper wind here, uh, which is sub-weakly interacting, uh, since then more weak interacting, and the neutralino is uh, this particular example. Then there could be axions with low lower masses and sub strongly sub-weak uh, cross-sections, and axinos is for many partners. I mentioned, I should mention also anti-symmetric dark matter up there. And there could be a gravitino, for example. There could be more, more, more candidates as well. I'm just putting the candidates that will be hard to move from the, from the list because they are very well motivated by particle physics. As you can see, most of them, all of them, point towards physics beyond the standard model. And in particular, axion, axino, and gravitino. Neutralino, axino, and gravitino point towards supersymmetry. 
So, uh, where is the wind? We don't know where the wind is. The mass range is very, very broad, so is the interaction range. And people, as I said, get inspiration from very different sources. Some run towards the, some look at the galactic center and see some excess there, some look at the various lines or whatever, and they get excited by what is happening there. And that's a fair game. Uh, as I said, my inspiration will come actually from the UHC. So before we get there, let's look at the situation actually before the LHC started in 2011, the wind mass versus typical versus spin interaction cross section, independent spin independent uh, detection cross section. Uh, and at that time, as you can see, uh, there were various islands and small masses, gamma, uh, crest, uh, CDMS, cogen. And there was a new limit coming at the time from Z100, which was of already some conflict. So we call, I call it the confusion zone, the low mass uh, region. And the high mass region here, coming mostly from supersymmetry, uh, motivated as a supersymmetry, uh, was coming uh, uh, it's on the other side. Uh, what happened since then, uh, 2013, uh, LAC had started, and also uh, LUX came up with a, with a new limit, which is marked here in red, which basically, along with some other limits, killed all the confusion zones. So the confusion zones should be, should, should be gone. What's happening on the upper side, on the, on the high mass side? Well, this theory prediction, which I showed also in the previous slide, is actually pre-LHC prediction from uh, these two groups. Michael, and it was sort of sticking out and appeared and as if it was so part, big part of it was appeared by the by, by Xenon 100 and Flux. It wasn't quite so because it was the LHC which actually killed the big part of it. Nevertheless, the sort of good in the community was that this part, that this theory really would be shifting down and right into basically oblivion to nowhere. I would argue that this is not quite so. It's indeed shifting down and right, but in a specific way, in a way which I will call a smoking gun. I'm trying to convince this is a smoking gun of supersymmetry. So I'll say that there is something here which will be a smoking gun of supersymmetry if it is confirmed. Let's look at the news from the LHC so far, from the first one. First of all, the Higgs mass. The Higgs was discovered, and its mass was found and measured at about 125 GeV. But otherwise, no convincing deviations from the standard ball were found in terms of indirect searches or in terms of putting the limits on any new physics like supersymmetry. So Fusion masses are now pushed to the TV scale plus some of the interacting So the news from the media was is supersymmetry dead, gone, this is not the way to go. I would say it's probably premature to go this to, to, to proceed to, to jump to such conclusions. For those who are not quite in the field, let me make, make a, a brief sort of introduction to supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a hidden symmetry, it's an extra symmetry. If you look at this uh, beautiful building in Taj Mahal, you see a lot of symmetries, it's always in most of art, but then it's sort of like symmetry among particles, but then if you look at it from the right view, you can also see some other symmetries, and this will be say symmetry between bosons and fermions. Uh, so supersymmetry, supersymmetry is a symmetry among, between bosons and fermions, and supersymmetric particles are supposed to be uh, partners of ordinary fermions. Or, or bosons, or, or from the bosons of bosons. So in addition to the standard level, uh, spectrum, there are supersymmetric particles. And the lightest of them would be wind, and the candidates of them for them would be either Fukino, Bino, Wino, or Higgsino. Now, getting to, the, to my talk now, what is the implication of the discovery of Higgs mass standard properties? And imagine if this is a blessing or a curse for supersymmetry. I try to argue that it's both. It's a blessing because the Higgs boson seems to be a fundamental scalar, and that points towards supersymmetry. It's light and standard like, and it's again pointing strongly towards low energy supersymmetry. Because unlike in the standard model, where the Higgs mass is just a free parameter, it could range all the way up to that wall and behind, 7800 GB. In low energy supersymmetry, the Higgs mass would only come up to about 130, because the few G. The fact it was just discovered within that window, between 115 
black planet and 130 few, a single remarkable. Remark. But at the same time, it was discovered close to the upper limit. That means something. I will a flash results within the context of the first results, within the context of the so called question and assembly, the subgraph framework, where the mass scalars, scalar masses, and the genome masses are unified, but the result will be actually general. Let's just do the following simple exercise. Let's build a likelihood function based on the Higgs mass only. Let's take the Higgs mass and let's plot in the supersymmetry in this model the values of parameters which correspond to this Higgs mass. Forget about anything else. Silica bound lines of dark matter, all the other constraints, everything. We also added CMS limit of all time, but it's irrelevant. You can see that in the Bayesian approach here, at one sigma, one sigma total probability, the preferred region corresponding to this X mass is between sort of a few, you know, around 1 TeV up to over, almost 7 TeV. So TeV scale is implied by the X mass. Also, on the common scale mass point of view, from the common scale mass point of view, TeV scale is preferred by the X mass value alone. alone. So there is no inconsistency between no tension between lower limits from uh, through the searches and the Higgs mass value. Uh, so if, for example, the Higgs mass were 116 GeV, then the preferred rate would be pushing down against the lower limits from direct searches. Then there would be a tension, but there isn't because the lower limits show already that the, the physics has to be at least 20 years or so, and this is what is also pointing at this where the Higgs mass is pointing. Now, what about dark matter? Are supposed to be talking about dark matter? Is it a blessing or is it a curse for dark matter? Well, let's see. Let's do a scan in this model. As I said, the result will be general, but I can illustrate it with this big scan in the CMS assembly, four CMS assembly parameters and four standard parameters, which are listed here, which is also need to be taken into account. And I'll be showing you Bayesian posterior probability regions. We're taking all the limits, all the constraints into account, as, as uh, should one should do, lower limits, the Higgs mass, omega x square, g minus 2, indirect, indirect uh, flavor uh, as constraints. But at the end, only those two are relevant. The rest become irrelevant. G minus 2 is the, the very old one. It doesn't fit anything. It's, uh, it's a spoiler in the whole thing. OK, so uh, when we do that, then let me remind you, before we had in this big plane this big preferred region at one signal. Adding the rate abundance Adding the right abundance selects only a few subregions in this big plane. And the subregions are well known, well understood. The previous scans, before the Higgs mass was discovered, were concentrating on this box for a few TeV only. And then there was a star correlation region and a final region, so called a final region, and they were corresponding to LSP, the wind, which was for many part of the big But now, expanding the range of, of scan to much larger. Uh, super symmetric parameters, just showing a, a solution which previously we didn't think of because it was just corresponding to much higher values for those for super symmetric parameters, a TEV Higgs E. And this reason is very nicely, naturally uh, fitting with the Higgs mass value. Let me just again point you towards this uh, reason show the fruit flavor by the Higgs mass. So TEV Higgs E, or like width, is implied by the Higgs mass value of 125 G, by the high Higgs mass value. What about detection? I can translate those theory regions, star colonization, a funnel, and the Higgs inner region into m chi versus sigma p in independent cross section. And you can see where they correspond to, where they, where they lie. And you can see that the previous regions, previously favorite regions, were actually quite low below even the one tone projections of one tone detectors, unlike the Higgs region, which is basically up for grabs by even current 
uh, mechanical line in the vectors if not by one term. So this is very exciting. That this Higgs Vino, which is favored by, I believe, by the dark matter, but by the Higgs math, is, uh, is also has the highest cross section for, for detection. Although this will be questioned, this has to be reviewed. Okay, it's also a generic solution, it's robust, present in many supersymmetric models, both unified and your non unified vectors, because if you just unify, it's also nine. All you need to do is make, make green genomes, B in particular, heavy enough, about one T, and then you get the right, the right product of abundance with the Higgs of course, and it's implied with the Higgs mass, and the right density, the two robust constraints. So, for example, in that next minimal supersymmetric model with an extra singlet, in this paper, people discovered this Higgs zeno without even knowing about it. Let me make a sort of small historical remark about the, the fall and the rise of the Higgs zeno, because it's quite amusing, and to which I actually contributed in a negative way, because in back in 1991, I, I thought I put it to grave by arguing that the Higgs zeno was not a good dark matter candidate, because at that time, very was was point was one, omega squared was one, if people believed. And no one thought about T and D scale supersymmetric masses. It was just way above what we wanted to have based on natural ones. Then with limits going up uh, and uh, and also omega squared going down to point one, you uh, Profumo in Yaguna in two thousand and four argued that it could be uh, Good candidate, but at mass of one TeV, unthinkably high. Uh, there was also a following paper by Antonio Petrino a few years later, and then in 2009, that was done in the context of the MSSM, so general MSSM without unification. In 2009, in our paper, in the, so next to the CMSSM framework, it's like the loser, we found a Higgs zeno solution as well, at one TeV. And that looked odd because we thought that the Bino was the only basic sensible solution in unified modes. But it wasn't, because you just had to go high enough. Or in um, you didn't have to go as far as in the CM system. And finally, after the Higgs boson mass was discovered, that measured, it came out that this is actually the region that is strongly favored by, by the Higgs mass back. So the Higgs Zeno is back on, on, a, on the table, and it's actually very, very exciting. What does this mean for the LHC, just very briefly? It doesn't mean anything good. Because if the lightest superpartner has a mass of 1 TeV, then all the other masses, all the other superpartners are heavier, that's for one thing. And second, the missing energy carried by the LSP will be so much that there won't be much of a signal left, chance of a signal left. So in simple models like this, there is not much chance for the LHC to see anything new. That's the prediction. Uh, in the Higgs sector, it could be different. As I said, it's a generic solution. Beyond the simplest scenarios, you could have, you could have a chances in the Higgs sector, but in the CMSSM and such models, chances are very, very slim. Uh, also, I should uh, maybe compare. We are using Bayesian analysis, Keith and Al are doing, uh, are doing K chi square analysis, and from their paper, they took this box, which is that's the overlapping box, uh, and you can see that. Their chi square analysis, which is shown here, actually shows a reasonably, a reasonably good sort of uh, agreement with, with our uh, high probability provisions, if you adjust the line. Uh, so it's, uh, it's all there. It's, it's, it's very, two different types of statistics give you the same, very similar solution because they are physical solutions. Shapes are slightly different. And in terms of uh, neutralino, they also start saying. Uh, this is just one summary plot from, taken from our recent physics reports review uh, from Virginia Kim and Kim uh, Choi and Harry Bear, if you wanted to have it all in one plot. The excellent also. So, the Higgs zeno of 1 TeV is to be a you know, candidate of choice for today, and we'll see. But let's have a broader context to see what, what is there still in supersymmetry, and for this we'll be taking the broadest sort of scenario that people Considering 19 parameter minimal supersymmetric model, uh, which has been studied in various contexts, in the MSSM and in the NHC and in dark matter, for which the, map, the parameters are listed here and also the ranges that we just handled. Kind of this is from the paper that will be coming, as I said, in a couple of days from now. 
In this, uh, in this uh, 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 approach, this is the mass of the wind, and this is the cross section for independent, independent uh, interactions. And you can recover the Higgs zeno, of course, at one TeV, but also because uh, the zeno masses are not unified, uh, you, have some, you can also have a Wino. And then you can also have the zeno Bino and the mixed region. Everything below, basically, the last two. And even below the neutrino floor. So you can see very, very wide ranges. Very, very wide ranges. Uh, so no real prediction. So this is the CMSSM and basically unified models, and this is the general situation. Let me just then point out you the 10 minus 12 is not here, and we're out here. So the general MSSM basically has a perfect number. Okay, what about indirect detection? First of all, positron uh, flux. We've heard already that there is uh, AMS2 is, is, is showing this rise, and then we start seeing the fall of the turnover of this in positron flux. One thing is that you image, even the general PMS system does not explain this. So, fortunately, there is this possibility to solve it, to explain this in terms of uh, pulsars, otherwise, it would be positive to supersymmetry. Now, CTA, and that's the last few minutes. What are the prospects for CTA? CTA is the new guy in town, a uh, big, big uh, you know, project for gamma ray astronomy, uh, which will hopefully, taken from the CTA site, improve the current limits, citing the updated limits, by an order of magnitude or more, and mostly on the sort of higher mass side, higher mass web site, which is good. This is high masses. So let's see what, uh, what are the chances of CTA. In the previous paper from May, we, which was an, an update of a previous paper, we included partial free loop corrections to the Higgs mass and uh, uh, some updates in the limits. We also showed the following uh, predictions for, for, uh, for CTA. This is sigma E versus M chi, the wind mass. And the Higgs zeno region is sticking out here. And uh, at that time, we used the scalar method, and then it used the derived the scalar method, which looked like it would miss the Higgs region by just a bit. Similarly, in the NUM in the model with an extra with extra Higgs parameters, uh, it looked like CTA is starting with 500 hours of exposure. However, in the new paper, we're using bin likelihood in energy likelihood method, where the limits are better, the predictions are better, and so it looks like there is a good chance for CTA actually to cover the whole, or most of the heat in the in unified models. How about uh, general supersymmetry? Uh, I don't think I have much time to actually go over the, the machinery here. Basically, we use the ring method, the on-off method, uh, we start with big lighting function, and uh, we use the instrument response function obtained from CTA, and we derive the following specific. This is for the uh, big bar finite planet states from the Italian radiation with the galactic center using the Pinasco profile. So the, the limit that we used before was the skeleton. Uh, uh, susceptibility limit, and the one from the likelihood ratio, as you can see, is quite a bit stronger. This is not a lot, I mean, it's 60% stronger. So, for the, NMS, for the MSSM, PMSSM, uh, we are showing here for the diagnostic plot, using our this big, big likelihood method, we are showing uh, for different channels, differences of the and you can see that they all point, they go towards values well below the canonical value of for thermal wind. So it's a good, 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 it seems like a, it's the way to go. It's, it's a slightly optimistic sensitivity, but it looks like uh, there is a good chance for, for, for the CPU. Let's have a look at this uh, closely. So this is MKI versus sigma V. Sigma lamp V is plotted here, and this the colors here is Wino, Higgs Zeno, and, uh, and Bino. 
And uh, here, I'm showing here different, different colors. Uh, CTA sensitivity. So red points will be, that will be excluded by CTA for the NFW profile. Brown points of age uh, will be excluded by assuming that it's an ASTA profile. While green points will not be uh, accessible to CTA. But you can see that basically a very wide range is here of, of uh, Higgsino and Paulino uh, points would be, would be cut. So in the general point PMS cell, very large, there's a very large spread of sigma V. It's, it's, a, it's not a very well motivated framework. Uh, but uh, but uh, even, even if you do not assume grand unification, which is a strong motivation for supersymmetry, even there, the, the, the CTA will cover a very wide range. More than that, you actually cover ranges not covered not to be covered by direct searches. So here is m chi versus uh, sigma p, spin independent. This is the current limit, this is the reach of one ton detectors, and this is the neutrino flow below which uh, experiments can't really go easily. Uh, and red points are the points uh, which will be excluded by CTA uh, assuming NFW. So even below the neutrino floor, uh, CTA can reach, can be excluded. Not only below the reach of quantum detectors, but even below the tree. This can be also seen here in this uh, sigma P versus uh, sigma V plane. So, see, quantum detectors will basically reach down to here, more or less. And all those solutions, the red ones and the beige ones, will be covered, will be uh, covered by, by CTA. As I said, even below the neutrino. And that's very exciting. <coughs> Okay, so uh, to summarize, of course, the jury is still out on what the dark matter is. The discoveries, claims come and go, refer and go here. But I believe that the Higgs mass value of 125 GeV is telling us that the dark matter uh, is supersymmetric, has a mass of close to 1 GeV, and it's Higgs zero. It's a familiar part of the Higgs boson. It's a robust prediction of unified and also phenomenological models. But in unified models, you see it much more clearly. In phenomenological models, you have so many parameters you can't say. You don't see the motivation. So if one TV win is discovered, and nothing is, else is seen, for example, the LHC, I still believe that it would be too hard to believe that there was an accident that the wind mass would have one TV would be a strong smoking gun for, for Susie for me. Big binary of the parameter space would be covered by Lux and Z100, even so in one of the running experiments, the current ones. And there will be an independent probe by CTA, and one ton detectors will cover it all, or most of them. Indirect detection modes are indirected with detection modes who probably see nothing, if this is the realized scenario. The scenario is the realized. Nor will the NHC see it. So this is a strong prediction. No discovery of DLC, no new signals of DLC, only CTA and the regular detection. No new detection was higher than that one. In general supersymmetry, I'll give you a broader context, CTA and direct detection will have a very good complementarity, good complementarity, very good complementarity, depending on the look, far beyond direct search of the DLC. And the much of the TV is in the probed. You are not in the expert in the field, and you want to just cut an idea other than that it's a Higgsian, or remember it's a Higgsian, I don't know, one message would be, of course. Good thing. <laughs> Sorry? It's good. Anyway, so it looked like, uh, I'll try to restore it. Uh, it looked like, it looks like supersymmetry, uh, maybe just too heavy for the AHC. Supersymmetry may be just too heavy for the LHC, but uh, dark matter searches are likely to come to the rescue. And uh, this is basically, I think, the end of my talk. Thank you. I have also a small announcement that I can do it. Right.
Are there any questions? So, uh, what's the lifespan of this? Oh, it's stable. It's stable. It's a stable. It's a stable particle. It's, uh, you assume a uh, certain discrete symmetry of our parity. So the, the, the particle is, the light is super particle is stable.
place which are also beautiful and not that far away from Europe, but you are from here, you may decide to take far away places. Uh, of course, and join us for the next year. Thank you. Thank you.
So uh, I'm just going to give you a few uh, a few points for why I think it's interesting to look at these uh, large scales. One uh, we've already seen before is that the general relativistic correction become crucial. You cannot really look at large scales without taking fully into account general relativity. So you need to include all these terms that will contribute to your observable, like the length magnification, uh, Doppler, local Doppler effects, Sachs Wolf, uh, and also all the integrated terms along the line of sight, uh, time delays, ice level, all that is to be taken into account. And uh, you see that it can actually make quite an effect. Uh, again, I think this is nice, it shows like the limit for BOSS here in terms of uh, what's been observed so far and we really passed, you know, one, two orders of magnitude to pass that. Of course, actually this pulse spec I'm showing here is not completely observable, observable as we've seen before. When you translate this, uh, you cannot really imagine as you cannot really make a clean measurement of the, of the 3D pulse spectrum. This will be translated to angular correlations and along the line of sight. But, you know, it gives you a good idea of what, what to expect and what type of signal we might, uh, we might find. So this is for GR. Uh, another interesting point is paramodern non -marciality. So um, we know that, well, uh, we usually parameterize this paramodern non -marciality by expanding the gravitational field in terms of, uh, to second order, in terms of this uh, Gaussian field here. And FNL is the parameter that will uh, tell you how much non-Gaussianity you have. And, uh, and so from, uh, just from inflation, at most you expect a FNL of 0.1, so the amount of non-Gaussianity will have there. Uh, but actually GR, the relativistic correction, will immediately give you something around uh, minus uh, 2 point something, so it's uh, 0.1. So you, in logical structure, you know for sure that FNL should not be zero. That's one point to take home. Up to now, uh, we've been, may, mainly been using the vice spectrum, so the three-point correlation function in the scene we to look after after this, so it's actually a nice, you know, in 2002 I had to make these measurements that would be less than 8 and now Planck is already telling it's less than 10, so, you know, we're closing the, the gap there for FNL. But, you know, looking at the vice spectrum is not the only, um, is not uh, the only uh, way to go after non gaussianity uh, in particular because uh, you have this initial non gaussian field the dark matter field is non gaussian then the way uh, matter collapses towards this uh, uh, this uh, ma uh, dark matter field will also uh, pick up this non gaussianity so the clustering of objects will change because of this non gaussianity and because the clustering will change the actually the, the bias with which the galaxies will trace the dark matter will change also, so the, the bias will actually acquire a scale dependence because of this normal scanning. And so, you cannot, so the galaxy will not be just a simple uh, uh, proportional uh, tracer of dark matter, there will be a scale dependence on large scales that will uh, have this 1 over k squared dependence. And you can see here this very clear on this uh, pulse spectrum, this is a 3D pulse spectrum. And as you go to these really, again, large scales, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, you see this uh, uh, bias turn picking up. Uh, and as I pointed out, again, once you observe this, this will be convolved in some way, so it's not, it, the seal will not be as clear as this, but it, again, it gives you a nice idea. So, uh, probing very large scales will also give you a very interesting handle on primarily non gaussianity that is completely different from what we have uh, used for the CMB. It's nothing to do with the vice spec, it's just a two-point correlation function here. Uh, another possible uh, uh, you know, signal is looking for modified gravity signatures uh, that try to explain what's happening with the dark energy. Uh, I mean, as well, so I think there's still a lot to explore here. I'm um, just showing you one plot where you can see some effects on large scales. Um, but, you know, I, I, my personal view is that you know, if there's some, something going on to explain uh, uh, dark energy that's, that's different from a uh, cosmological constant, then probably uh, this should somehow affect large scales, so you might, you might expect something going on there also. And, um, and finally, as a, uh, one final example of why you should look at large scales, there's always this idea of testing the cosmological principle. So, uh, look at the uh, isotropy. And, and compared to maybe the, the CMB analysis that you see and we hear about it 
on back to our first aid. Test the homogeneity on several other, several other scales. Um, so to, to see if you can really assume this, this principle. And, and one interesting thing, this is already being done in radio galaxies, but we're going to do it at uh, an, an extreme level of precision, is to see if the dipole that we measure from uh, the distribution of these uh, observed radio galaxies is aligned with the CME dipole. And if it has the same magnitude, and at the moment they actually, it's more or less aligned, but uh, it's stronger, supposedly stronger than the CME. So that's another thing that needs to be checked. So I hope I gave you like a, a, you know an overview that made you uh, got interest on this, uh, on, on looking at these little large scales, and and so what we need to go after this, uh, we uh, always need very large volumes uh, because I'm talking here about three-dimensional uh, scales. That's important because you need to reach these large scales, but it's also important because you need to beat cosmic variance. So um, you need many samples of the same scale. This is obviously very hard to achieve. It's the opposite of what we do with the A survey. You need to go wide and deep at the same time. Um, so surveys over large areas of the sky and uh, to uh, high ratios. Uh, radio surveys, in, in that sense, will give you a very uh, nice handle on this. Uh, not only because, for instance, the, for the 21 centimeter line, you have access to hydrogen, which is should be abundant even up to high rate shift so uh, compared to other lights uh, and the, the other option is that continuous surveys will be massive numbers of galaxies this is beyond any survey that you'll have in the future so those those are two things to take into account when thinking about radio to, to do this and i'll start with one example and that's uh, h1 galaxy service with the ska um, so uh, the idea here is to use the 31 centimeter line uh, pre already in the 30s in the, in the morning. Um, so to do this kind of service, we're going to detect galaxies all across the sky. You do need high signal to noise to make a detection of one single galaxy. And you need large number of these galaxies across all over the sky to be shot noise. So these are very expensive surveys. And in fact, with SK-1, so I'm showing here uh, the number counts of expected for galaxies, the function of redshift. And this dashed line here is, let's say, the, the cutoff uh, when you become cosmic variance dominated. So if you want to always be above this uh, these number, this line here to make a cosmology, let's say. And for SK1, it would be quite hard. But once you beat this threshold of the seven microgenskies there, uh, which will be achieved with SK2, then you can really push very, very far in the universe, uh, above even redshift 2, to do this type of uh, service. And, uh, and you know, you get the redshift for free, right, because you're observing the line immediately with the same instrument there. Now, there is no follow-up. So you do expect, at least with SK2, to, to, to make some interesting science with it. And this is one example of a work we did uh, using a SK2 H1 galaxy survey to try to constrain non gaussianity uh, using the power spectrum only, the observation of the power spectrum. So, um, so the effect on large scales, I should point out that we use the proper you know, angular power spectrum as a function of redshift, so we took into account all the observable uh, quantities there, and we didn't do any flat sky approximation that should be quite wrong in this case. And we also factor in all the GR corrections here, okay? So all the magnification bias, evolution bias, all that was being included in this analysis. And it's actually crucial because once you reach this regime where you're probing very, very small fluctuations on the power spectrum, then you need to include all the GR corrections. Otherwise, the, there'll be a bias on your, on your results. And this, just look at this plot here. These are the constraints of, on that FNL factor I told before, which we know should be at least of order one, uh, 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 even, if, even if in a pure uh, non-Gaussian uh, universe. And you see that with SK2, you can really get, you know, one semi constraints around 1.5 already. And, uh, and as I want to emphasize again, it's crucial that you include GR corrections there. So it's quite interesting, but it's also very expensive. You need to wait a few more years for SK2. Uh, what we love. Uh, soon uh, with SK1 is access to this uh, intensity map mapping technique that was referred uh, briefly by Prina in the morning. 
So the, the point is that uh, for these large scales, it's not really, not really interested in seeing galaxies, you know. Um, so you can actually give up detecting them and look at large pixels where you inter integrate the line emission from all these galaxies. And then you just look at fluctuations. You make maps of this intensity and just look at the fluctuation of this intensity. So here we have, uh, actually this is a proper simulation of uh, H1 galaxies. And, and this is the corresponding um, intensity mapping of the same field where you can clearly see the, you know, the kind of uh, dark matter web there. And so it's just like a, a CMB experiment, except that now we're doing this um, in 3D. So it can be uh, uh, quite useful to probe large scales. And uh, in particular, I think it's quite useful to do intensity mapping in H1. Um, I can give you the chance of thinking about other lines to use, and it's actually hard, especially for the type of relationships you're interested. It seems that the 21 centimeter line is really appropriate for this kind of surveys. Um, you know, you have H1 that's quite abundant up to, up to high redshifts. Uh, radio is talking about low frequencies, so uh, talk, you have uh, the, the beam, your, your angular resolution is quite low, which is good because it means you can do a fast survey. And also because you are looking at low frequencies, there is very little contamination from any other line. So that's also a very nice uh, aspect of this. And this is actually a simulation of the H1. Uh, emission, emission the H1 intensity mapping up to redshift 3.5, kind of uh, what to expect to observe with the SKA, which accounts for like 50% of the co moving universe. So, uh, just a brief uh, mention of how we calculate this H1 signal. It's actually uh, quite straightforward. So, our signal is like an average, one single pixel of many galaxies in that pixel. So, just averaging over the, all these galaxies. So, it's quite easy to relate the, the H1 mass here, which is what we need, to the underlying dark matter yellow mass in that pixel. And that's, you can use that function as our model, and from that you calculate the H1 density. And then the power spectrum depends on this density, and also on the bias uh, with relation to the underlying dark matter. And so uh, you can see here uh, just the bias times the temperature of the intensity, which is actually the quantity that matters for the power spectrum. And these are uh, the model we're using at the moment. This blue one, this blue one here, as a function of redshift, it actually fits quite well all the data that's that's available so far. And it has this nice feature that the signal is increasing redshift, which is something that you usually don't have with a typical uh, galaxy survey. The other thing that we need to uh, be concerned about is if the bias. Is of the signal is actually uh, uh, some scale dependence because we try to pick scale uh, fluctuations uh, on the power spectrum. So if there is some scale dependence on these uh, bias, we have a problem here. But simulations show this should be okay. Even this one, which is kind of outside the, the, the fitting uh, area, uh, starting at you know above 10 to the minus one, it's okay. And don't, don't forget that we're looking at scale that are much much uh, uh, above that. So smaller k modes, so they should be fine, the bias should be linear on those scales. And so I'll jump into the experiments that are available. We basically have two types of experiments here. We have the typical large dish uh, radio telescopes like the GBT in the US. There's some proposal here for being moved uh, from uh, Manchester, which was aimed at probing this intensity mapping signal. So they'll, they'll, this will just scan the sky, right? We'll just uh, move around and scan the sky. Uh, the other option is it's using these type of interferometers where they will observe most of the sky in just one pointing, just you know, uh, pointing up, and then you know, uh, get the, res the resolution, the angular resolution by cross-correlating the elements. And uh, there's already some experiments uh, funded, uh, being built for this. Uh, and so this is a, another way to look at it. Uh, the, there's already been uh, using the GBT um, telescope, uh, that big telescope in the US, there's already been some measurements of these intensity mapping signals. It's not completely just theory now. Uh, on, the, on the map here, you know, it is a very low signal to noise map here. You actually, you've not seen the signal there. But on the, by cross correlating this H1 signal with, uh, with the galaxies, galaxies from the Wibblesee survey, you can actually find a, a, a correlation, a high signal to noise correlation there. So that was a detection and that will constrain 
this H1 density times the bias at 13.8 to be this value. So our models need to follow that fit over there. So there's been a detection, at least in cross-correlation already, and we want to move, move forward and detect actual um, alto power spectrum. Uh, so I mean, this this talk fits into the SKA, and uh, and I'll start to by by talking about this next uh, generation of dish arrays. They are quite powerful, and they can actually be used also for intensity mapping. So here in South Africa, we'll have, soon enough, we'll have 64 dishes <coughs> that will give you a lot of plating area. You can use these as both interferometers or single dish experiments. And uh, my proposal is actually because of uh, we need low, low resolution is to actually look at each dish as a single dish uh, uh, object. And we were already doing tests to, to see how this works, this uh, single dish observation works with seven dishes we have right now uh, called CAT7 that's already taking data at the moment. Uh, the SK1 will be kind of the ultimate intensity mapping machine for, for this type of signal. And so the main idea is, is really to use each dish in single observation mode. So you don't throw away the cost correlations that will be a waste. They are used for many other surveys. And you actually use them to calibrate. But because you want survey speed, you want to have really low resolution, so you use the dish instead. Each dish is like a one degree resolution, so you can scan the, the sky quite fast. And you have like in South Africa, you have 254 of those dishes. So that gives you a lot of uh, scanning speed. So it would be a, a great instrument for this type of observations. And it's been, it's already in the path for the SK, it's been uh, accepted. Uh, and so it's something that we hope it will be uh, going through. Um, yeah, so I should point out that obviously, uh, as Priya mentioned in the morning, you can use these techniques using SK1 to make brilliant uh, measurements of the BAO scales. I'm not talking about that now, I'm talking about even larger scales. And I like this plot uh, quite a lot because it shows you the error expect on the power spectrum over the, the power spectrum itself. So it's like inverse of signal to noise um, on these large scales. So actually, you know, we can push even to larger scales than this, uh, but in terms of the type of uh, forecasting we did here, it's kind of on the limit where I can still trust uh, this approach using the 3D power spectrum. So uh, this is what I'm showing now. But you know, this is already past the equality scale. And, uh, and you can see these, uh, these are the combination of several SK setups. And they all, they all basically cosmic variance dominated, all the SK setups, including SK mid. Uh, one, phase one to be set in South Africa. It will make a really uh, high signal to noise detection of this scale up to redshift three, more or less. So this is using intensity mapping. So there's a lot of power there, and that we need to, fit, to factor in all the you know the GR corrections when measuring that. And so just to go briefly now over some of these uh, possible uh, measurements that we can obtain with intensity mapping. Obviously, the, the um, you know I think one of the interesting ones is looking at this effect of primordial non-Gaussianity on uh, on your power spectrum. We did that uh, considering SKA phase one. And, uh, and so, because we can probe these up to very high redshifts, sheets, we have a lot of column to, to probe, you see here. So Planck gives you a constraint around six, one signal constraint, and this is what you expect uh, from intensity mapping as a function of, as you go deeper in and deeper in, in the survey, so you can easily go down to uh, constraints of around one also. Uh, using this intensity mapping. And you know, if, even if you don't believe uh, non gaussianity you can look at it at this FNL as a proxy to tell you, oh well, you're going to measure these, these very large scales for some other theory that you might think of. So it means that as you go up in redshift with, S, with SK1 in intensity mapping, you can really probe very well at sub percent level, level of these, uh, you know, these large scales. Obviously, uh, this is up to redshift 3 there. If uh, you actually you could keep going, so as you go to higher and higher rate shifts, uh, you, you'll be able to probe larger volumes, moving volumes. And at the same time, the, the horizon, the horizon of those rate shifts will decrease, so it will be, be easier to probe these, uh, these ultra large scales. And so one idea is to go 
into the epoch where hydrogen is no longer just in galaxies, it will be everywhere. So it will be in the intergalactic medium. Even in that case, so you have all these weird emissions from hydrogen at high rate shifts, but even in that case, if you average over large enough volumes, the fluctuations you measure should still be a, a, a good trace of the underlying dark matter. So you might be able to use these uh, with experiments like SKLO to probe uh, large scales. So a uh, good thing I'll just briefly go to, to something that you know people don't like, which is uh, you know problems, uh, in particularly uh, foregrounds, which are uh, a bit of an issue with intensity mapping. So with, with galaxies, you you uh, basically detect the galaxies, so you see the galaxies in that city, you count them. With intensity mapping, uh, you need to remove anything else that falls into your pixel. That's what you call foregrounds, and uh, you know the galaxy is like. 10 to the 4 order of magnitude above your signal. So that's always the problem that you need to deal with. You have many other foregrounds here, like you know, point sources and uh, polarization leakage and all that. But this is all being considered already, and I can say that at least for the typical foregrounds that people think about, it's not really a problem. I think just, uh, uh, you know, there's, I'm not going to detail here, but this is actually uh, the intensity mapping signal plus the galactic, plus all the foregrounds, point sources, galactic, signal turn emission, all that. So basically what you see here is our galaxy, the emission from our galaxy. Uh, this is the, uh, the initial signal that we put in, in this simulation, just the intensity mapping signal. And this is what we recover after applying our, our methods. So, you know, it's even hard to pick up any difference between the two. So, you know, at least at this level, there are other issues, but at least at this level, we have already the techniques to deal with foregrounds. Right, but, you know, just to close in, and uh, this is related to foregrounds uh, also, uh, we might think about, instead of just looking at one signal, to cross-correlate signals from two different surveys. So, for instance, intensity mapping with some galaxy survey, or, or between different galaxy surveys, you know, there are different possibilities. That, that's, that in terms of foregrounds and, and, um, and any, and, and any uh, systematics is quite a big advantage because, you know, by cross-correlating you are removing uh, those issues so you can clean down those, those residuals. But there's another uh, advantage is that you, know, this, you can use this so-called multi-tracer technique to try to beat cosmic variance. And so this is quite useful for large scales because, again, you don't have that many modes uh, to probe. So you, if you can find a way to beat cosmic variance there, that can be quite useful. So the idea is basically, so our universe, our dark matter is one realization of, of many possibilities for the same cosmology. So if you want to go from here to your cosmology, we have like different routes to that, and that's what we call cosmic variance. But Imagine now, but if you go down and you can imagine two different traces of the same underlying dark matter field, so you take, let's say, two different photographs of the same field with using two types of surveys, these surveys will uh, trace the dark matter with the different pipes depending on the, on the mass of, for instance, of these galaxies, if you're talking about the galaxy survey. And so because you, you, because you measure these fluctuations, you can immediately get an angle on the ratio of one bias compared to the other bias without having the need to go back and understand what is the cosmology because you're just comparing two different pictures of the same underlying dark matter field. So if you interest on quantities that are just represented by this bias, you are completely free of, uh, of uh, any cosmic variance. One example is this, this non-Gaussianity that shows up on, on large scales. The correction will show up in the bias. So you can see by looking at the ratio, the only contaminant there then will be your shot noise, your thermal noise, not, not cosmic variance. Uh, in terms of GR corrections, there are some of the GR corrections that can also be factorized into this bias. So you can also, uh, 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 from that point of view, you can also remove the effect of cosmic variance. And we actually, so there are many ways to go about this. We actually just, last slide, uh, we actually did this uh, with the easiest possible survey you can imagine, which is uh, in the radio, which is a, a galaxy a radio continuum survey. It's like the most common, we already have uh, large uh, full sky surveys in the radio for this, and we imagine, okay, what with the 
Meerkat and later on with SK, what, what can we do? And the idea is this, okay, we do not have redshift information in here, this is a continuum survey. So you detect a large amount of galaxies but without any redshift information. But we are able to beam those galaxies into mass pits. So because you can separate these galaxy populations, so we can beam them in ways that each tracer will have a different bias, will follow dark matter with a different bias. And you can use that, thereby cross-correlating these different tracers, you can use that to be the cosmic variance. And so the black line is what you would expect, uh, or expect from if you just look at the full survey and try to uh, measure this, non this bias, in this case for non-mausiality. Basically, if you are able to beam the, into this, this population, galaxy population, to five samples, which, you know, it's, it's a bit hard, but just as an example, you'll drop from there to there. This is just because you remove this cosmic variance effect. Everything is the same, just the number of galaxies, everything is factory is the same, so you can really compare the two and, and see the improvement. With SK1 and the type of sensitivity, you're probably around there. And you know, to be conservative, you might be able to split into three population beams. So if you already get uh, FNL constraint around two point something, which is quite good because it's a continuum survey. It will be the first survey that we'll do uh, with, with SK. So it's uh, really, so it's really encouraging. And also with SK two, you can really go uh, much lower than that. So you know, it's a really nice idea. And okay, just uh, adding now. Uh, so. You know, I hope I kind of uh, uh, excited you a bit about looking at total large scales, uh, the crucial scenes of new physics. You know, we need to look outside the box here for non gaussian and GR corrections, homogeneity, and all that. In particular, intensity mapping, uh, mapping technique is actually a great way to get these large volumes and, it, and to push to uh, high rate shifts. And from that point of view, there's actually a new approach to use SK1 as a single dish survey, let's say, that can be uh, used for this intensity mapping. On top of that, it might be used other extra techniques to um, uh, remove this uh, cosmic variance effect using the multi trust technique. So I think, you know, the, 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 my point is, at the same time, think about BAO, there are all these data will be coming online and it will, all, it will provide these large scale uh, measurements, so we should start thinking about them. Maybe there's something there. Okay. Thank you. I have, <clears throat> I have a question to, to, to start with. If you use the signal dishes, um, your sensitivity goes down. How, how far can you go on redshift then? Oh, no, the sensitivity does, does not necessarily go down here because you still have the same collecting area. But you just, you just because in terms of intensity mapping, the um, you know the well, the size of the dish doesn't really matter for for intense for brightness sensitivity if, if that's what you're looking for. So it's okay. Uh, it's it's not going to lose uh, that capability. So you but so we we you're going to be able to push this up to redshift three with with SK one uh, single dish with with a single dish survey. But this is I'm talking redshift three of, over the whole sky. So it's not uh, so it's like a, a thirty thousand square degree survey up to ratio three. You do get that it's, it's, it's possible because it's like two between two hundred and three hundred dishes. That gives you enough. So it's like having it's like having one GB instead of one GBT dish you have like two hundred and fifty four at the same time. Uh, it's equivalent to that because the size of the dish for brightness is still does not really matter. It matters for resolution but not for for sensitivity, so it works quite well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a theoretical limit on leading cosmic invariance. In terms of statistics, right? How do you balance that? This is what I'm saying. You're not really. The thing is, that you're not really um, uh, trying to recover the cosmology from from your realization. You know, if you try to go back and figure out from one realization what is your cosmology, then you have cosmic variance because it's one realization, one Gaussian realization from many. But I'm just saying, using that same look at that same realization, different galaxy population will trace that same realization in a different way. 
No, 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 because in case you just interest on the bias. Oh, okay, from that point of view. Just on the bias. Oh. Then, then, you, then you can compare those two, and that, that is free of cosmic variance. Just the bias. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, we need to continue because we are running out of time. So let's thank the speaker again. And the next speaker is um, Keith Ali. And he will talk about PEB supersymmetry and dark matter. Scale, 
the Higgs soft masses run negative, and they, that triggers the electric symmetry breaking. So it's a beautiful feature of the model. I think one that's that really keeps a lot of the theorists involved in supersymmetry because it's a, it's a very natural way of understanding the electroweak symmetry breaking. And at the weak scale, then you, you take two of the normal parameters you would think of, the mu term, which is the Higgs mixing mass term, and uh, another supersymmetry breaking term uh, called mu, uh, and those are just determined at the, at the weak scale. So the free parameters are the gauge mass, the scalar mass, there's a trilinear mass term uh, in supersymmetry, and the ratio of the two Higgs values. Uh, which, which you would choose. Uh, in minimal supergravity models, you get an extra constraint. This B term uh, has to be related to the A term and the gravitino mass, and it's the gravitino mass that actually determines your scalar masses. So uh, it's the same set of conditions. The only difference is that you now have to specify B, and if you have to specify B at, at the high scale, then you have to solve for something else, and normally you would solve for, say, tangent beta. So that you lose tangent beta as a free parameter at the weak scale. So years ago, we did a sort of scan, a global scan of uh, the CMSSM parameter space looking for what kind of Higgs masses come out. And this was a point also made by Kaiser uh, yesterday. Uh, that typically, it's less than 130. And here, you see most of the models give it less than 128 GeV. Um, that's also now been pushed uh, beyond this point, but this was in the region of scanning that, that we would consider normal at the time, probably up to a TV, I don't remember exactly what we used, but up to probably about a TV sort of masses, uh, you would never get Higgs masses larger than about 128 uh, GeV. On the right, uh, we imposed some phenomenological cuts in the red, where you try and get this anomalous magnetic moment of the muon to come out right, which was again another exciting and motivating factor at the time, uh, which I think right now would, uh, you'd have to say is lost. So here again, you see that there's essentially no room for the, for the heavy Higgses, and, and you really would have liked to have a Higgs around 116, maybe even 119 GeV. Okay? But then, you really should have discovered supersymmetry at the LHC before the Higgs. So the fact that supersymmetry wasn't discovered, and the Higgs comes out at 125 GeV, actually makes a lot of sense in retrospect. So, Another way of analyzing the parameter space, uh, Legic talked about the, uh, the uh, Bayesian analysis. Uh, we use uh, frequentist analysis uh, based on, on master code. Uh, I don't go through the details of what we do, but uh, again, it's a purely chi-squared statistic looking at a number of different um, uh, experimental observables. And before the LHC, this is again similar to what Legic had in the Bayesian case, the predictions were really of very low energy. Right? There was a lot of excitement, you say, that, and a lot of this was really driven by G minus 2, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, but you really focused on the, the low part of the mass spectrum, small scalar masses, small gauge genome masses, and things looked really hopeful. From the point of view of dark matter, again, now here I superimposed with the modern limits, but the, the predictions at the time really said that, well, dark matter should have been discovered. Um, and clearly it hasn't. The limits kept getting stronger and stronger. So what happened? Another way to represent supersymmetric parameter space is here the axes are reversed. Okay, genome mass is on the bottom, scalar mass is going up. Dark red regions are excluded because you have charged effect, you have charged dark matter. Uh, the dark green is where you have uh, uh, poor agreement with beta as gamma, uh, a rare decay of the B, uh, B meson. The, uh, pinkish region is where you do get agreement with the G minus 2. And the dark blue is where you get the right relative density. I guess I have a So the dark blue is where you get the, the right relative density coming out. And this is for two different values of tangent beta. And once the LHC came on, the LHC constraints here are, are shown by this purple line. And as time went on, the purple line kept moving to the right, to the right, to the right. Um, we have seven there, we have one more. And all of this good parameter space for supersymmetric super models started getting excluded more and more so. And pay attention also, it's the value, these are Higgs mass contours, 114, 119. So even these are too low. The Higgs mass constraints really supersedes the uh, direct searches from the LHC. A uh, little bit more room here, but the tangent beta 55 will have other problems as you see next. 
So what's left on a parameter plane like this? Uh, this is the, the current final uh, LHC run one uh, limit. And now here I've chosen a much larger value of, of this A term. By choosing a larger A term, you have uh, you, you induce the splitting of the stop masses, and that allows you to have larger Higgs masses. And so here you see the Higgs mass contours, which now are getting into the range, which is observable. But you see 125 is out here. This is the so-called uh, style co-annihilation strip, where the relic density is determined by co-annihilations of, in this case, the Bino and the Stahl uh, uh, slept on. And it essentially runs out. You don't get out to the 125 uh, uh, GeV Higgs. At a larger tangent beta, you have the strip goes out a little bit farther. It goes out past the Higgs. But you have another constraint coming in here. And this is the constraint coming from another rare decay of the B. Uh, this is B to mu, uh, mu plus mu minus, and you have to be past this line. So you'd say, well, this is starting to look extremely constrained. Even these thin lines now that you were forced to, there's actually another thin line going up this way, which I'll come back to in a second, which is the stop co-annihilation strip. So along here, the, the Mino and the stop are nearly degenerate, and co-annihilations there get you the right relic density. So if you take an intermediate value, then you have, again, this uh, co-annihilation strip here, the co-annihilation strip there. And there are some regions that still work. So there is, it's not dead. It's not, uh, it's not been all shut off. But it's really been pushed here into a corner. Uh, this is an Amersugra model. And so you also have contours of uh, tangent beta plotted here, tangent beta 40, tangent beta 35. The B to mu mu uh, exclusion, again, you have to be to the right of that. So you do have a little bit of a style co-annihilation strip here. But there's not a real lot left. The stop strip, so here's a, a blow up of the parameter space. And now I'm going out to larger values of the gay genome masses, out to 4 TeV here, out to 10 TeV in the scalar masses. And now the, the style co-annihilation strip, which was, I showed you before, is just buried in this corner. There is a blue region that follows up along this line. You might be able to see it a little bit better here. And same thing here. So there's a, still a possibility of going out to high masses and getting this sort of CMSSM-like parameter space to look out. How far does that strip go out? You can see that a little bit more clearly here, where it's plotted. This is the mass difference between the dark matter candidate, in this case the Dino, the LSP, and the stop, the lightest stop. So this is in GeV, so this is a 40 GeV mass difference. Uh, and the gain genome mass here, the uh, dark matter mass is about 40% of this. So uh, well, you, can, you can take 40% of this value and you'll get it. So it's a 2 TeV here, about 2 TeV for the dark matter here. And you also see plotted the, uh, the Higgs mass. And so you'd like to have your curves intersect here. Uh, so. Uh, it, this region would be okay for the dark matter, uh, but not out here where the Higgs mass is up at around now 130. So once you start going into this multi-TEV range, the Higgs mass can creep up a little bit. Uh, for another choice of, uh, of parameters, this can be at 40. Now you can go out and you have dark matter candidates up along near the endpoint of the strip, of this strip, which goes out to 8 TeV or so. so you are getting pushed farther and farther, and actually Ledger did show this plot uh, from the uh, frequentist analysis where the best fit now for us is out there uh, at, at very high masses. Collectively, what you get is something that looks like this. Uh, the CMSSM results are sitting here. Uh, this is showing you the, the minimum chi-square. What you want to compare it with is what, uh, what we have down here is the standard model a chi-square uh, coming from you know, all of these observables. Uh, also shown here is the NUHM, uh, so it, which has the uh, one extra parameter in this case. Uh, and the p-value here, you see, is getting low. Right? These things started out at around 30%, which is very encouraging. And now they're down at 5.5%. Uh, it's maybe still a little bit better for the, not really better, but the, for the NUHM compared to the standard model p-value, which is 5%. So you're getting down to the point where there's not a real lot of difference between the supersymmetric solutions and the standard model in terms of the phenomenological improvement in the model. Um, and just for reference, uh, the, in the case of the NUHM1, for this point here, indeed, uh, as Legic was, was, uh, was discussing, 
uh, we do have the, it's the, the lightest superconductor particle is a xeno uh, at around 15 meters. So uh, in this case, it's still a xeno where your relic density is governed by um, annihilations to a Higgs pole. And then where is the uh, prediction now after run one for the uh, elastic cross section? Well, it's down. It's down quite a bit, a couple orders of magnitude below the current limits again. So, are there other possibilities? Yes, again, I mentioned you can go to either the NUHN 1 or 2, where you have two, one or two new free parameters. You can go to other models as well, which I, I won't discuss, but I'll just give you a, a hint of what happens in the NUHN 1, for example. In this case, uh, we're choosing new to be a free parameter and just fixing it to be at 500 GeV. This again is Xeno dark matter in this strip. At, uh, at lower values of M1 half, you have your ordinary Beano dark matter. This would be your normal stout co-annihilation strip. There's the uh, LHC exclusion, but again, here it's very low Higgs masses. Uh, on, the, on the right side, it's all Xeno dark matter, uh, but here the relic density is too small, and inside here you get the right relic density as well. So here you have very nice candidates again with about one TeV. Uh, Higgs in the dark matter. On the right, choosing the uh, pseudoscalar mass to be your free parameter uh, and fix it at uh, about a TeV. And now you have a uh, good relic density. In this case, it is a silicino going through uh, the Higgs pole annihilations. Now, if you move beyond, the next thing I want to do is move beyond these CMSSM like parameters and go towards um, these models with. Uh, strongly stabilized moduli, and uh, I'll describe what that is, what that means, and why you want to do it, and that leads to uh, a version of supersymmetry which has been called pure gravity mediation. Uh, these moduli are really prevalent in all supersymmetric theories. They're usually ignored because either they're problematic or you just assume that there's something else in the theory that, that solves it and you put it at high energy and you don't want to worry about it. They're extremely difficult for, from the point of view of being able to detect them. So from a phenomenological point of view, unless you fix the problem with them, they're really irrelevant. But in general, they cause all sorts of problems. Uh, there are a lot of them. They can cause, the volume modulus can cause destabilization and say sort of straight compactifications. The Bologna-like fields, which are responsible for supersymmetry breaking, for example, have been known since the early 80s to give you all sorts of cosmological uh, problems associated with entropy production or gravitino production or even LSP production through their, late, uh, through their late decays. So what do you do with it? Well, one way is just to make them heavy, as I said. If you, if there's a way to stabilize these moduli so that they're relatively heavy. Uh, you can separate them out from the spectrum. And one way to do that is to add another term to the Kähler potential. Now, the Kähler potential for the relativist, this is like a metric in field space, so the derivative of this with respect to a field and its conjugate uh, gives you uh, the metric in field space. And uh, the, uh, by adding, this is effectively, it's a quartic term in the Kähler potential. Lambda here is some scale below the Planck scale, and that causes stabilization of, uh, this is the Polony field, with a regular Polony superpotential. So if you're familiar with the simplest models of supersymmetry breaking, you would recognize this. This drives the field to a, a minimum which is near the origin. Remember, lambda is below the Planck scale. Typically, in the Polony model itself, the minimum would be at the Planck scale. Uh, and uh, this constant is solved to cancel the cosmological constant to be about 1 over 3. What does that do? It gives you a gravitino mass, which is again equaling to this parameter of mu. This is not the same mu, I'm sorry, the uh, same letter for uh, multiple uses. So this is the supersymmetry breaking scale. Uh, the Polony field are all now at uh, masses equal to the gravitino mass, but divided by the scale lambda, and so are much larger than the gravitino mass. And that alone is enough to really cure these cosmological problems associated with the, with the moduli. The consequences are now that the scalar masses are still, just like in the CMSSM or M sugra, the scalar masses are given to you by the gravitino mass, but the A terms are small. In fact, they're proportional to lambda squared, which is, could be very small, in which case the A terms are really get, are driven by one loop corrections or anomalies, and so these become the dominant terms. Similar uh, fashion, gageino masses are also small and are loop suppressed relative to the scalar masses, and they're also driven by anomalies. 
So you have sort of this mixed situation where you have gravity-induced gravity, uh, uh, masses for the scalars, but you have anomaly mediated uh, masses for your uh, gay genomes. So in pure gravity mediation, uh, it's really, in, in some sense, it would really be a one-parameter model. The only parameter you have is the gravitino mass. The gravitino mass now determines everything for you. The only problem is getting electroweak symmetry breaking to work because tangent beta isn't free. And, and uh, it's very hard with the one parameter to actually get electroweak, radiative electroweak symmetry breaking to work. You can cure that by freeing up tangent beta as a free parameter, and that, in, that requires you to add another term to the Kähler potential, so one extra parameter, which is called the judici Maziero term. I don't go to that in any detail, but uh, that allows you to choose tangent beta. So with these two parameters now, you can actually find things that, that work. That's all you need to have a, a successful model. So the gauge genome masses are given by the one loop uh, suppression due to the gravitino mass. These are just the normal gauge coupling. And the A terms are also given by these same type of uh, loop suppressions. The trouble is, is now this pushes you to very, very large masses. Okay. So what do you get typically? You get spermion and gravitino masses, which are going up to the region of order 100 TeV, actually up to PeV, hence the title. Uh, the Higgs Eno uh, are typically, and the heavier Higgs bosons are also typically at this order. The Higgs Eno masses are quite a bit lighter, so in terms of detectability, uh, in the lower end of the ranges that I'll be talking about, you have still the Gaginos, which are in the LHC detectable range, and in particular what you'd be interested in is the Gluino mass, uh, which could still be detectable in principle. Uh, the LSP, in most of these cases, uh, and uh, uh, come to exception uh, before I conclude, is the uh, LSP is generally the Wino. Uh, with a nearly degenerate uh, charged Wino. Okay. And the Higgs boson mass can be made uh, consistent with this 125, as you'll see next. So you have two parameters, uh, it, the gravitino mass, which is just shown here for the different curves, and tangent beta. We're talking about very different region in, in the parameter space globally. It's a very restricted range in tangent beta, somewhere between about 2 and 3, or between 1.7 and 3. Gravitino mass is anywhere up from 60 TeV, okay, very different mass ranges, out to 1.5 PeV. And in this band, it's probably a little bit too large of a band now, but there's still, of course, uncertainty in the calculation of the Higgs mass. You're going to get the right Higgs mass of this 125, 126. Four gravitino masses somewhere between 300 TeV and 1.5 PeV. Okay. The uh, neutralino mass, the, the LSP mass here, which is, again, as I said, is Typically, the Wino is shown here, uh, and this is down. This is 1 TeV for the Wino, 2 TeV for the Wino. So these are still at significantly lower energies, at least uh, collider accessible energies still. If you relax some of the constraint and go back to something like an NUHM1 model, so you have now three parameters, still very, very minimal in terms of set, set of total number of parameters. Here are the two Higgs masses. Uh, soft masses are, are uh, constrained to be equal. Gravitino mass, this is a low case, it's 60 TeV. The Wino mass is 170 GeV. You get a little bit more freedom. These are contours of the Higgs mass, so here you see 129 GeV, this is 128, 27. So you can get uh, the right Higgs mass in this region of uh, tangent beta of around 4 or 5. So a little bit more freedom there. And similarly, you see that here, where you're trying to get the right Higgs mass in this horizontal band for larger values of tangent beta depending on your choice of the gravitino mass, which is always relatively large. And what happened to dark matter? This is not ideal for dark matter. Uh, of course, though, as Leszek said, there are other possibilities for dark matter. Uh, it could be the axion, of course. Uh, uh, and the dark matter could come from some non-thermal production source rather than a thermal production source. It is still possible to get thermal. We know dark matter when the mu term is negative. The, the, it, the results are very sensitive to the sign of the mu parameter now, uh, and that has to do with the threshold corrections which determine the we know mass. Uh, this is for positive mu. It's almost it's very difficult to get uh, the right relic density. But for uh, mu negative, if the gravitino mass is again about a half a PeV, you will get the right uh, relic density. But there's potential problems for we know dark matter, uh, and that's coming 
from uh, results from Fermi and Hess. Uh, that, uh, this provides typically provides signals which would have already been excluded. So we know dark matter uh, is not uh, is not ideal. Uh, now. This will make Legic a little bit happier because now there are ways to get xenodark matter out of this kind of scenarios, and that's the last thing I want to talk about. Uh, if you're going with an NUHM1 light model, so that you just, and you're using electric symmetry breaking conditions to so again determine these uh, haze soft masses, which are now different from all the rest of them, but they're going to be on the order of the gravity mass. You have you can choose your three free parameters to be mu, tangent beta and M3 halves. And when mu is small, uh, you will get into the region where you have a hazino dark matter candidate. Uh, you can do other things which I won't go into. Um, from a point of view of history, so this one, Legic might remember this picture because it's one of the few here old enough to, to, to know, sorry. Uh, this is back in 1989. Uh, this is the parameter space that Mark Swedenicki and I looked at, uh, this was so old it wasn't even called a mu term then. This is actually positive mu, what we called it epsilon in those days. Uh, you'll also see something, a relic from the past here. Uh, there's a particle here called the photino. Nobody talks about the photino anymore, but it used to be a viable dark matter candidate, but you see it's far, far into the corner uh, of low masses. And this is M2, this is the uh, SU2 left agino mass. And here you see the region where you have a, a pure Bino LSP, a pure Higgsino LSP. And on the right, you see the omega h squared conflict. And as Legic said, in those days, the real limit was omega h squared is equal to 1. I mean, that was as much as we knew. And if omega h squared about a quarter, you get exactly this 1 TeV Higgsino mass. And so, so that, that's been around. Uh, it's sort of been left in, in mothballs, but maybe it's, it's going to come out now even more strongly. So in these pure gravity mediated models, what you're seeing here, the, the red here is not excluded. The red here is just where you have Gino dark matter, or actually Guino dark matter, or the Guino LSP. Uh, and the blue strips are, again, where you have the right relic density. And so very prominent here, again, very low values of tangent beta, 1.8 in this case. You have here the contours, the mass contours of the LSP. When they're vertical, it's the Xeno. When they're horizontal, it's the Wino. So here's Wino dark matter again, the right relic density for the Wino uh, and for the, uh, for the Hexino. And at the larger uh, tangent beta, it gets a little bit harder because also shown here are the mass contours for the Higgs. This is 129, 128, 127. So it's hard to get the uh, Higgs mass low enough at tangent beta 2.2, but there's no problem at all in tangent beta 1.8. Sort of an expanded view of this going out back to the large masses that are maybe more typical of these uh, pure gravity mediated models as shown here. So this is a log plot. So this is a Higgsino dark matter strip where you get the right relic density uh, and an acceptable uh, Higgs mass, and then going out for the large uh, Higgs, uh, uh, large Higgsino masses. With it, so you have we know uh, we know LSP there. There's still another way. This is essentially the last thing I'm going to uh, mention. There's another way of getting uh, Higgsino dark matter. Uh, and that is if you add, or sorry, not the xeno dark matter, but non-mino non like dark matter, or non-mino dark like uh, matter, is adding uh, additional multiplets to your theory. In this case, adding a, either a pair, either a 10 or 10 bar pair, or 5 or 5 bar pair to your theory, and coupling it to the Higgs. By doing that, you affect the running, the anomaly mediated running of the uh, of the gauge, uh, gauge geno masses, and so you alter the pattern that you normally find Gino mediated models. So where normally you would have the Wino as the LSP and, uh, and a progression to the Bino and the Gluino, here you can actually end up with the Gluino as the lightest dark matter, the lightest uh, supersymmetric candidate, which would of course be ruled out. But there's a region where the Gluino and Bino are actually degenerate in mass, and you would get good dark matter in that region. So this is still high gravitino masses, even higher here. You see the crossover is sitting out here at about 300 TeV between the uh, Luino and, uh, and the Bino. Uh, and again, you can get the right H masses in those cases as well. So just to summarize, uh, what we know, what we know is that since the Higgs mass is 126 GV, supersymmetry has not been discovered. These very simple models have been pushed out of our previous zone of comfort 
where we've been thinking about it for years and years uh, at, at sort of the 100 or few hundred GeV level. It's been pushed out to the TV, multi-TV, tens of TV, and they've tried to argue maybe even hundreds of TV up to a PUV level. Uh, there are phenomenological solutions still viable. So as Legic said, supersymmetry is not dead, it's just been moved. Uh, and uh, what I tried to argue is that these models for strong stabilization still provide you with a good cosmological framework. In fact, you have to do something like this to avoid the cosmological problem. And they lead to very specific types of predictions, specific types of models, which in principle are very simple, with very, very few parameters, and are still predictive. So I'm close with that. That's right. So if you if you want to generalize the model right, and add more parameters, you can certainly do that and still find corners of the parameter space, other corners of the parameter space with lighter masses. You can do that. Uh, from uh, depends what you call a corner. Yeah. I think you know my problem with that. My problem with that is that I don't want to introduce a lot of parameters at the weak scale. Because if I start observing more, if I start introducing more parameters than I have observables, I don't know that I'm actually doing anything. And I always will insist that you have to take supersymmetry up to some very high scale. Because that was the, if you want, one of the original motivations. Why are we, why are we doing supersymmetry? Supersymmetry should be present somewhere, either at the magnification scale or the Planck scale. If you, certainly, if you want to talk about something, something like the hierarchy problem, the big hierarchy problem. So somehow you have to be able to run up it to to some high scale, and at that high scale, you should have some theory that's telling you something about your parameters. Now, you could say we don't know very much about the theory at high scale, and you have a lot of parameters at the high scale. You run them down, you choose your parameters at low scale, you run them back up. Of course. Choosing parameters at the low scale doesn't guarantee that you'll have anything that makes any sense at the high scale. Whereas if you choose things sensibly at the high scale and run them down, you'll always have something uh, that's sensible. So it's a little bit of a point of view until something is discovered you don't know. Uh, you know, it would be great if they do discover something at 50 GeV in what I would call still a corner of, of, of uh, supersymmetric parameter space, because uh, then you have something definite. That would be better. Uh, but maybe they'll find something at 2 TV, a Duino at 2 or 3 TV, still under the, the cutoff of the LHC reach. All right. I think we have to stop here because time for coffee. We only have 15 minutes left until the, the parallel session starts. So let's stop. I uh, think all the speakers again.